Okay. So our challenge is, how do we use what is undoubtedly very, very relevant technology? How do we get to a stage where we can design a structure that is effective here, so that achieves, uh, achieves the engineering objectives that link back to the clinical objectives? But, but also, we're now faced with a different tackle, uh, a challenge. If we're trying to manufacture structures that can actually be used in helmets, so if we're trying to replace this expanded polystyrene layer with a layer that looks something like this, then we've also got commercial constraints to consider as well. And that is to say that these things are incredibly light. The foam is pretty cheap. This is incredibly expensive. And depending on the density of our structure, becomes very quickly a lot heavier. The price we'll deal with some other day. We, we can't limit ourselves on price because it could be that we can use additive manufacturing to find this ideal structure and then go through a more conventional route to manufacture lots of them. Additive manufacturing is good at relatively affordably giving you a one-off. If you then find your optimal configuration, it may be that you can then go and build a mold that allows you to injection mold that final shape. But we wanted to go back to basics, and, and we saw these images a few days ago. And we remind ourselves that the brain is within the skull, pretty obvious, and there's a layer of cerebrospinal fluid. The cerebrospinal fluid effectively suspends the brain within a layer of fluid that acts to dampen any severe loading. And as we touched on just before the break, we have a question of what are we trying to do? We're trying to protect the brain against this from someone having a sudden stop as a consequence of something that they didn't otherwise expect to happen. If we look more closely at this interaction, then the brain is our area of interest. And during that interaction, we have the brain effectively continue moving forward as our head stops. And so we hit the lamppost, but the brain doesn't stop. The brain moves forward because it's floating in that layer of cerebrospinal fluid. That means you get bleeding here. And in some cases, the energy is so extreme that the brain hits the front of the head and then rebounds and hits the back of the head or the back of the skull as well. So you get coup and contra coup as the clinical terms for injury. You get an accumulation of bleeding here, and you get an accumulation of bleeding at the opposite side of where the impact took place. And so that's fundamentally the biomechanics that we are trying to get involved in. And we had this conversation as well. We have two things of the same mass, one that moves relatively slowly, one that moves relatively fast. Fundamentally, these are two very different engineering scenarios that we're trying to mitigate against. One, using half mv squared, gives us a relatively low energy. The second gives us a relatively high energy. So one will mean the brain 
slowly displaces. The second will mean that that happens far faster. And so half mv squared means something to the clinical scenario that we're trying to protect against. You have a lower energy impact and you have a higher energy impact. In low energy impact, you're probably going to have sub-injurious conditions, and so you don't get any immediate neurological change. Increase the energy, and you will. And so when we think back to our first slides, these very high energy impacts lead to immediate brain injury. Lower energy impacts don't give any immediate neurological change because they're sub pre injury. But we know that an accumulation of subjurious, sub injurious impacts does eventually present risk of injury. So we're trying to identify how to improve technology by generating new materials that fit within a helmet. But it's also important to consider what exists at the minute. And so again, much like the American football image at the start, we have this hard outer layer on pretty much any helmet bar the children's bicycle one. And that hard outer layer prevents penetration. And so if you fall off and happen to land on something sharp, the role of this layer is to prevent penetration. It also dissipates the impact load across a greater area, which means that the underlying energy absorbing layer, which is typically foam, can then try and dissipate that energy over a greater proportion of its volume. And foam goes through significant deformation, plastic deformation, when talking about expanded polystyrene, during an impact. But the challenge that we currently have is that to initiate this plastic deformation, you need to ensure that you strike your expanded polystyrene with the correct load. Too little load, and nothing happens. Too big a load, and it squashes entirely, and it doesn't achieve energy absorption at all. Strike it with an energy load that's about right, and you get this optimal performance. You get a gentle crushing of the foam that doesn't get to a point where there's nothing else left to compress. So you have energy absorption that protects the brain from moving relative to the skull. But identifying and then achieving a design that is focused on a very narrow range of energies is quite demanding. And so it means that Helmet designers have a decision. Do they aim at the relatively low energy collisions and so have a relatively porous foam that deforms and so is protecting the head? If you select that option, then when you have a greater energy that's applied, your very porous foam will squash entirely and offer no protection at all. Alternatively, you can go for a more dense foam, decrease the porosity, which means that if you do topple off your bicycle at relatively low energies, then the foam will be too stiff. It won't really do anything. It won't offer you any protection at all. But get struck by a car on your bicycle, and you're entering into an energy window that is more 
likely to cause the foam to actively deform. And so current technologies inherently limit the effectiveness of a helmet. If this is a motorcycling helmet, too little energy, and it doesn't do anything, but you're at risk of minor brain injury. Too much energy, if you're struck by a lorry, it won't do anything because the foam squashes entirely and doesn't absorb energy. And so engineers currently have to design a helmet that in some way reflects a likely collision and that offers the best value in terms of protection. And so helmets generally are designed to protect against a single severe injury, recognizing that if the impact is too severe, it will in essence offer very little benefit. If the impact isn't severe enough, then it won't offer any benefit either. If we go back to examples such as this, these helmets are designed to, present, to prevent severe injury. The foams in here are elastic foams. If anyone's ever watched NFL, then there are a series of head collisions per game. And so if they used expanded polystyrene, which is a better energy absorber, or a good energy absorber, that's used in motorcycle helmets, if they use expanded polystyrene in American football that plastically deforms, then every time you have a head collision, you'd have to swap your helmet over because it compresses and then stays there. And after that, there's very little deformation that can be achieved whilst absorbing impact, uh, whilst absorbing energy before the material becomes redundant. And so NFL helmets are designed with an elastic foam liner that protects against the risk of multiple impacts that might be severe. But do little because of the nature of foams to protect against less severe impacts, which when accumulated through the career of someone that's exposed to these type of collisions on a day-to-day -day basis, presents risk. And it was Dr. Umalu back in the early 2000s that performed an autopsy on a former NFL player, Mike Webster. And that autopsy involves taking slices of the brain tissue, examining them under a microscope and seeing whether it looks consistent with a normal brain. But he found that there was evidence of chronic traumatic encephalopathy or CTE. CTE is a known condition and it has personality changes including disturbances in memory, it means that you walk differently and that you have a different personality. And this was the first one, but since there have been 165 other autopsies on NFL players, of which 131 had CTE cases. And so whereas CTE is prevalent in some people in the ordinary population, as it were, if you expose your brain by playing elite American football to a career involving this, then you have approaching a one-to-one -one likelihood of getting this. And eventually, 2016, the story is dated, 2002, the first link was made. Eventually, the NFL acknowledges that if you play elite level football, from our perspective, if you expose your head to minor impacts on a day-to-day -day basis over 
a career of maybe 15, 20, 25 years, if you expose it to that biomechanical environment, then you're at greater risk of getting a certain brain condition. We go back to this. We know that there is a displacement in the brain during a minor collision. It doesn't cause immediate injury. But we touched on these a few days ago, these folds here in the brain, the sulky. And this is where the autopsies were focusing on. The surrounding area of this tissue isn't blank. It's not a, a blank slide. The surrounding area here is, is what normal cells look like in the brain. And at these areas of folding, which as engineers would recognize represents a risk of stress concentration, the autopsy showed a very different type of cell. The little hole in the middle is a, a blood vessel. Again, this is in 2D. Imagine the, the vessel tunneling through this tissue. And as you get the subtle vibration of the tissue against a relatively fixed rod, you expose it at risk of a stress concentration. And in the autopsy of these NFL players, you see evidence of a change in cell type around those locations, reported in McKee et al. in 2013. And so it becomes apparent that there is a risk of brain change or tissue change at the areas of stress concentration in people that are exposed to lots of relatively low energy collisions. And this work has since been supplemented with a, an FE study by Gadraj from, uh, from Imperial, who has got a, a relatively high resolution brain model and has identified when replicating a kind of collision that is common in, in American football, that you do get increased stress and strain at these folds. So not hugely surprising, but begins to underpin and correlate our engineering understanding with what's happening anatomically and then what's presenting clinically too. So linking back into what's happening at the minute, this is the inside of an American football helmet. A number of separate pads, ignoring the foam bit, that's a, a cushion layer that mechanically offers little protection. It's the 24 mil of foam underneath that's of interest. And we go back to basics, basics that define the performance of a foam. This initial stiffness of the foam, we're interested in the area under the curve that indicates the amount of energy absorbed. And so you want to get to a stage of plateau as quickly as possible because then you start to absorb energy. But if your strain is too high because your collision is too great in terms of its energy, then you suddenly lose the capacity to absorb anything. So if you're up here somewhere, and your strain goes on and on because the energy is too great for your foam, then this period becomes relatively small and so it's, it's almost ineffective. And so we knew what we wanted to do. We wanted to start replacing this material with a new material, going back to our lattice structures from earlier on. And we were beginning to understand the theory of how energy absorbing materials work. 
we want to dent uh, we want to delay this period of densification where the capability of absorbing energy disappears when you pass this dotted line. And we want to try and make this region as long as possible. That's a theory. That's our motivation. How do you link the two, knowing that you have a technology such as additive manufacturing that allows you to design and build pretty much anything? These slides are, or these images aren't ours. These are nominal cellular structures that are undergoing deformation. And we're doing similar work using structures that are also rather nominal at the minute. These are informative and indicative of what we're after because there is an objective of having a mass that is comparable to, to foam. And that in itself is, is really quite a demanding objective function to be uh, operating within because foam is so light. But if we want our work to have any impact, and that is for people to actually want to adopt this technology and implement it in, in the real world so that it does improve quality of life, then manufacturers are saying that if any new helmets that adopt this kind of technology are notably heavier than existing solutions, then consumers won't buy them. In the UK, a motorcyclist by, by law has to wear a helmet. Cyclists are becoming more likely to wear a helmet. That's not mandated, but out of choice. But manufacturers recognize that size, aesthetics, and mass are the two key drivers towards consumers selecting their um, product of choice. Which puts us in an interesting scenario. We know and understand the neurology, the, the brain biomechanics. We understand the engineering theory. We have a capacity potentially to develop a solution. And yet we have commercial constraints that are driven by what consumers are prepared to accept. We broke this down to give us two key questions. Can a new structure be identified that enables us to increase this plateau region? That whilst bending is constantly absorbing energy until eventually you reach a point, reach a point of densification. But not only that, can a new material be identified that effectively enables the foam to become more effective or to become effective earlier so that you don't have a helmet that's targeted only at severe impacts. Can that severe impact helmet buckle sooner when the impact energy is less to avoid it effectively giving merely a rigid response when you were to undergo a, a less severe injury scenario? Additive manufacturing is not a new technology, but is a new technology in terms of the range of materials and the potential to achieve functionality from it. We've had a facility for 20 odd years, and it's predominantly been used to check that the design of new components fit well enough together. So does your lid and your bottle integrate as per your CAD drawing? The functionality is irrelevant. You merely want to check whether your design is correct. And so this technology isn't hugely new. It involves a volume of powder and a laser melting that powder together. It does one line. That sintered layer of powder drops into a bed. Fresh powder is wiped over the top. And it does a second layer. That layer merge with the first, drops into the bed, enabling you to do a third, fourth, and so on. A relatively limited number of materials that can be used with it. And so whilst 
there is an increasing capability of using this technique for functionality. That's only relevant if you can operate within those two polymers. Although that said, there are now metal machines as well that enable you to do steel, aluminium, titanium um, builds as well. One of the good things is that because this design is constantly sinking into the powder, you can actually build a bridge if you wanted to and not worry about how you're going to get the overhang of that design to work. That's to say, that if you were to build this out of bricks or any other construction material, supporting the arch as you build it is notoriously difficult. Whereas here, because the components are constantly sinking into a bed of powder, when it comes to building the next layer above the line, then there is a volume of powder that's underneath that will support that build. And so you can build very complex shapes by using this technique. This is the more affordable approach. Machines can start at three or four hundred dollars of fused deposition modeling devices. And that requires a roll of material, typically polymer, and a hot nozzle and XY coordinates and ability to move in an XY plane. The polymer is melted and is deposited on the plate and the extruder moves to the next point. And so you can cheaply and quickly build a model that's advantageous. It's not as good to support designs such as this. We started off using the expensive laser sintered process and then realized that we had far more control over this process. And so we've now got a lab with a series of machines of fused deposition modeling. And we typically bypass our industrial based facility that would enable us to do this kind of stuff. And we're a group that enjoys finite elements. We're lucky that we have the ability to design these and to test them. But ultimately, given the potential geometries that you can produce in additive manufacturing, PhD students soon got bored of manufacturing something else and traipsing off downstairs to test it and finding out that their solution that they've just built was only marginally better, if at all, than their attempts from the weeks and months previously. So we found that finite element gives us a more systematic or a more efficient way of testing our new structures. Being blunt, it gives us a better capability to deal with our inability of optimizing our structure in a mathematical manner. But in doing FE and using new materials that are emerging all the time, we suddenly realized that we didn't have any material data to put into the machine, uh, to put into the simulation. And so we're currently working on a couple of papers that describe our efforts of characterizing new 3D printed polymers. So we now have some numbers that we can put into our simulations, and our simulations run relatively well. Our next task was to try and in some way find a structure that would provide a good starting point. We saw earlier our efforts of using the cube-like structures and curving those into something that looked not dissimilar to a helmet. And we realized that that was a rather naive way of trying to solve a complex problem. And so we started looking for, in the literature, solutions that had been proposed previously. A group in Cambridge had highlighted the potential of an origami-based structure that had layers of folded material on top of one another. 
They had looked at blast previously. We were looking at strain rates far lower than that. Additive manufacturing gives us an opportunity to actually physically build some of these complex layers that previously had only really been achieved either by folding paper or in the case of the work that Cambridge reported, they had vacuum formed some steel sheets by etching them and then bending them into place uh, and stacking them one on top of another. We tried to use FE to optimize these. And we started changing the parameters, the fold parameters, to see whether that would in any way influence the response. And we're dealing with two different layers, a dark gray and a light gray layer that are alternatively, uh, alternatively stacked together. And if you start changing some of the angles of these layers, does that change the overall mechanical response? And we started changing these patterns, these parameters, uh, and we found in FE that we got some kind of response that was or some kind of change that gave us hope that we could eventually find a method of optimizing this for head protection. We got to a stage in Abacus where we could run a simulation of our basic curved impactor with the correct mass and our structure that we had I refrain from using the word optimize, but from our most favorably performing structure. That was a vertical impact. That actually showed the material densifying. It was too soft. Of course, as you all well know, FE gives you an opportunity to conveniently and efficiently look at other parameters. And so we looked at some kind of shear impact, some angled impact. And again, we were moderately convinced that this was broadly representative of, of what we wanted to see. At that stage, our Material model was relatively poor, meaning that despite the fact we were getting obvious full compression or densification of the material, and so it wasn't representative of what was actually happening, as a milestone in terms of informing and improving our FE model, then we were relatively convinced or content that we were going in the right direction, though it clearly needed further work. So we manufactured some of these pieces. This is one of them. <clears throat> we inclined it. And then we struck it with one of those aluminum heads. That's in super slow motion. And we can see that the amount of deformation was nowhere near what we were getting in FEA. The FEA one fully compressed. This one didn't appear to compress at all. But again, it gave us new challenges. <clears throat> How do we know what's happening inside the material itself? We can see that the edge doesn't seem to compress very much, although the, the rig gets in the way. But ultimately, we're not after what's happening at the edge because the metal head form doesn't strike the edge at all. It strikes the center. So how do you see what's happening in the middle of your material when you can only reasonably assess what's happening on the side? You can get data from the head form, which shows uh, deceleration. The head form becomes detached from the machine itself, and so you can't use a, uh, a machine-based measure of displacement and so deformation. And so we can start to work back from the acceleration that we get from the head form. But that doesn't tell you how each of the layers or each of the structures in here are performing. So there is 
an opportunity to optimize each of these angles if we had a better understanding as to what was happening. So we've gone on to try and do more systematic FEA, where we have tried to quasi-statically load our structure. Here we see the platens gradually squashing the material, and we try and replicate that with an FEA to 20% compression. And we're seeing that there's bending in one of the layers. If we go back a slide and a slide again, that's fully extent, or that's at zero compression. There is a, an angle coming out, and then back in again, out and then back in again out and then back in again. So we've got two layers of out in, out in. Two layers of material that is on top of one another. And so we're trying to use this configuration to bend and so absorb energy. And we're seeing an FE going from zero to 10 that we're losing height. And it seems though there's some kind of bending um, happening at that interface. And that extends as we get to to 20%. Go to 30%. Buckling's happened here. Not as well represented here as perhaps we would like. And so, again, indicating that our material model is not as good as what it should be. But we're getting moderately good comparison between our <clears throat> blue FE trends and our orange mechanical test data. So that indicates that we're moving towards a position where we can accurately simulate this. But it doesn't really give us any more information as to how we can start changing the parameters of that structure to optimize it, or indeed, whether that structure is the correct structure at all to be considering. That was, a, in essence, an arbitrary structure that we found in the, pay, in the literature that looked promising, although the strain rate was in totally different regime in blast than what we're looking at. And so that's what we choose to, chose to adopt and to follow. But it's inherently highly dense. And that's the exact opposite of what our design constraint prescribes. From a mechanical perspective, we're starting with our more recent modeling to, to look favorable. So the MO is the Mura Ori structure that we're dealing with here versus a collision or an impact involving foams. And so we're starting at higher energies to get lower accelerations. One of our Earlier attempts were submitted to the NFL as a material that might have promised to be used in helmets, and uh, we secured some funding from them. Our more recent work is looking at the second question. Can we identify a new material? So we have a PhD student looking at the structure. We have a PhD student now looking at the material. Can we find a material that is strain rate dependent? So that at low impact energies, we start to see our material absorbing energy at lower energies. At higher impact energies, the material behaves in a more stiff manner and so doesn't reach densification either. The current scenario is you design a helmet with a prescribed foam, and it will have this characteristic. And so if you don't have enough deformation, if the impact energy is not high enough, then it won't absorb any energy at all. If you have too much deformation, then you go beyond the ability to absorb energy. And so it's, again, not hugely effective. Can we identify a new material? that enters this period of energy absorption 
irrespective of whether it's lower or higher impact energy environments. Which opens us then to the world of viscoelastic materials. Viscoelastic materials behave differently at different strain rates. They become stiffer at different strain rates. Our initial data using two hyperelastic materials and our viscoelastic material. So this is the same impact mass at two meters per second for all of these tests. And our viscoelastic material, all of which had the same geometry, had a head impact acceleration that's broadly comparable to our other two hyperelastic solutions. What we want to happen is as the impact energy or the strain rate increases, and our peak acceleration g is our measure of interest. That's what we correlate back to HIC and head injury severity. With our hyperelastic materials, we generally see that kind of behavior, that they are stiff originally or initially, and so are relatively ineffective at absorbing energy, so you get a relatively high G for a relatively low load. They then enter this plateau region, and so they're effective at absorbing energy, and so the increase in G is relatively small given the increase in deformation. But get beyond the ability to absorb energy, have too much strain, and G goes up sharply. What we hope that our hyperelastic materials do is something not dissimilar to that. So you can continue to increase the strain rate, but you don't end up with this exponential increase in G. It might be that we have to compromise some of the earlier performance to avoid going into this densified portion of deformation. Here's what's happening at the minute with our original data, or our initial data. As we increase from 2 to 3 to 4 to 5 meters per second, so the impact energy, half mv squared, is going up. Our hyperelastic materials of the same structure are reaching densification. So look at the Vn. It begins to increase exponentially, much like on the graph, uh, the black line on the board. LVS is Luvacin, so Vn is vinyl nitrile. That's the, hel the foam from the, the helmets currently, which highlights the problem, that they're effective to a point, and then their performance window is exceeded, and they shoot up because of densification. Our hyperelastic material, LVS, Luvacin, has delayed densification versus vinyl nitrile, so it has equal performance at lower impact energies, and we've managed to delay densification, so it's still effective at a relatively modest impact energy, but then it gets to a point itself where it densifies and escalates up. Our latest solution using our viscoelastic material, we compromise a little bit marginally at the lower impact energy, compromises more substantial at more modest impact energies, but as we go up and up, we see that we seem to be avoiding densification. That's to say that at increasing strain rates, the material is behaving stiffer and so doesn't progress past 
this dotted line and into densification. So that's where we are currently at in terms of our work with head protection. We have two questions that, in essence, remain our focus, one of which is we still aren't happy that we're being systematic with not only the structure that we've initially adopted, but then our theories and our methodology about optimizing that. And we don't really understand the chemistry as to what a viscoelastic material would look like and what would be the favorable traits of those materials. And so, whilst undoubtedly we're making progress, and one would expect to, given that we've got three PhD students now working on this, we're making favorable progress, but there's still lots of work and opportunities to be explored. Thank you very much. A picture of Cardiff in the sun, which if you speak to my wife, who had to go and tie down everything in our garden last night because it was uh, about to have a storm and she was still wet in the afternoon from going to work in the morning, then that's probably a slightly dishonest picture of Cardiff today. But uh, maybe it's changed overnight. Any questions? Strain rate properties of the bone. Okay. As ever, good question. Um, and I wish there was a, a nice, easy, straightforward answer. Um, but there's not. So there's, as you rightly say, there's, there are strain rate studies on bone. Um, we could go off and do a strain rate study tomorrow on bone that would add value to the literature. We would be able to find, I'm sure, some kind of animal model that, with uh, approval from a, an appropriate ethical panel. We could put into a machine and we could test at a series of rates that would demonstrate a trait that hasn't been well reported before. And so it's, it's relatively easy to add additional data to the literature. The problem is, um, is that we and others um, have to rely on animal models. Um, and we do our best to make sure that the animal model is as fresh as possible. But that animal model is still geometrically different to a human leg or any other human bone. Um, and that you're taking it out of a physiological environment as well. And so whilst we try and keep, for example, the skin on to retain some moisture um, and to mimic better the biomechanics, by keeping the skin on means that you can only get limited data from your, from your study. And so there is no shortage of data that is, that is already in the literature and no doubt will be produced in the future based on the strain rate dependency of bone. The trick is getting studies that add real value. Um, and some of the uh, initial plots that we uh, discussed that correlate um, impact energies and impact accelerations with injury, they're the extremely valuable, highly cited studies because they were based on um, cadaveric studies and um, more accurate animal models um, that were um, approved back in the 70s. Um, and so we have got some very good data that correlates quite strongly, we believe, with um, impact exposure and, and injury. But as we've touched on numerous times previously, one of the challenges of working in this sector is trying to identify the high quality correlation and data because it's rare that people get opportunity to use um, or, or to perform testing that is as accurate as one would like it to be for the application ultimately that we're working in. And so in answer, there are no shortage of bone strain rate studies out there. Um, how do we select the one that's most relevant, given that they're probably all, or the vast majority, are on animals? Um, and then how do we take that data and apply it in some way to, to the tissue that we're looking at? In terms of bone here, we don't concern ourselves with, with skull fracture, um, because skull fracture is a very rare occurrence that is a, a different um, injury nature entirely. Uh, we're looking at the protective material to be strain rate dependent, and that strain rate dependence having advantage to the underlying soft tissues that we're trying to protect. Make sense?
Um, ah, that's a good question. Um, um, what is the use of studies that are in the literature, I guess, is, is in essence your question. Um, the, the job of the author who's writing the study is to try and argue that there is a gap in the knowledge that needs to be filled. And so one would hope that all the studies out there are in some way adding value to the literature. Maybe the animal model that they're using is more appropriate than ones that were published previously. Maybe the rates of strain they're looking at are more consistent or different uh, and targeted at a different injury scenario than pa uh, papers that have been published previously. Uh, maybe the methodology for measuring the injury is, is advanced or different and so offers a different set of raw data for other researchers to use. And so it would be quite reasonable that there are more than one study or, or that there is more than one study published that describes bone strain and bone strain rate dependency. Um, I think the, the danger is or the, what we shouldn't be seeing is studies that effectively repeat data that's out there already. Uh, and that's one fundamental um, box that you have to tick when it comes to publication and that your work is adding uh, value to the literature, that it's new and that it's novel. Um, it can be new and novel and it also cover bone, uh, bone strain because of the, the different methodologies and approaches that could be used. Uh, and so it's quite reasonable that there could be multiple studies out there on bone strain, but all of them should be adding something slightly different to the literature, um, meaning that depending on the study you intend to embark on, um, some will be relevant, but some will be irrelevant to what you want to do. Okay? Yeah. Skull fracture is, um, the principles are the same. Um, skull fractures can be uh, left to heal, so that if there is Intrusion of the skull into the brain tissue itself, and that, that clearly is a, a serious condition. Um, uh, and so that would be surgically operated on to um, either remove the bone and cover it with a plate. And so that's where um, additive manufacturing solutions could come back into focus because you can design a specific plate prior to additive manufacturing. And, and indeed, in, in other countries, the need for a person-specific implant isn't required. You have a plate with a series of holes, and if it's too big, then it's too big. Um, so you would fundamentally look to ensure the bone is protected. Uh, if there's a fracture in the plate but it's not intruding, then it would be reasonable to let that heal. Um, the, the, the amount of stability in the, the skull is greater than the amount of stability in the, the long bones, and so there wouldn't be a need to wrap the head in some kind of uh, material to immobilize the skull because it's relatively immobile anyway. Um, you can, yeah, you can use screws and plates and screws. They can be screwed into position, um, but you have to be careful clearly that you don't go through the bone into the brain. And so um, that's an engineering solution that has existed for some time, and, and there's not great problems that are associated with it, to my knowledge. Um, and so a, a traditional kind of bone plate um, construction would be used without too many problems, to my knowledge. Absolutely, um, and you touch on a very topical subject because what we need to be aware of is that the, the technology in helmets has only really been evolving over the last five, maybe 10 years tops. Um, in the 1970s, I believe, when helmets were first introduced um, or when the, kind of the, the wearing of helmets became more widespread, um, they were predominantly a foam construction. And so rolling forward 40 or 50 years, we're in a position where the technology hasn't really evolved all that much. Um, people have tried to, to get riders to wear um, neck supports that have airbags in them so that as the airbag senses you're falling off, then it explodes around you to, to provide protection. Um, I don't think those trials have been discontinued, but that activity is being undertaken by, by a very small number of research groups in the world. Um, and so as we discussed here, that the likelihood of them falling across the correct solution first time is probably quite small. Um, 
I think it's an interesting question. I, I mean, I think that the need to absorb impact probably on a day-to-day -day scenario extends beyond the head. One of the common examples that we see in terms of injury through falling um, is the hip joint again. Uh, and without wanting to go back to, to old topics that we've done previously, a picture that I get no better at drawing, but is probably familiar to most of you by now. So there's our hip joint. And we know that over time, the bone becomes weaker. And the bone, when it does become weaker, is going to be particularly susceptible to fracture at the neck of the femur. So that's the femur bone, and that's the neck. And so any kind of falling that has any kind of impact anywhere, really, when this is weak, the likelihood of fracture here becomes higher. And so, for example, in the UK, the number of femoral neck fractures that we see is high. Why? Because people are walking along, elderly people are walking along who aren't particularly stable on their feet, and they trip over something. They fall, they have some kind of unusual force exposed to their, their leg, which exceeds the strength of this part of the bone because it's got thinner. If we could have a layer here that absorbs energy, then the likelihood of this happening reduces. Now, people have realized that for a number of years and so have come up with all kinds of relatively crude in inventions. And so a thigh guard from cricket in essence, has been the solution of choice. Certainly in the Western world, having the conversation that someone is getting to an age where they should start to walk around with a cricket thigh pad on is not an easy conversation to have. The likelihood of you falling over when you need to go to the toilets in the middle of the night, the room is dark, your eyes aren't working as well, that's when these fractures typically happen. Are you going to get out of bed and put your cricket thigh pad on to walk from here to there? Are you going to go to sleep with your cricket thigh pad on? So these are the real challenges that exist. How do you get people that are vulnerable in community better protected? And the technology here and the technology here is quite similar. But in reality, we've probably got an easier job here because the risk is more apparent. If you ride a motorcycle, if you ride a bicycle, the, the likelihood of you falling off is, is quite obvious. The likelihood of you falling over as you take 10 steps from your bed to the toilet seems almost ridiculous. And yet the consequence of that happening is probably more, or certainly more immediate than the types of injury that we're talking about here. But how do we instigate a solution that is culturally accepted, that offers value to the community. And that's what we're talking about here and here as well. Uh, and so you're right to say that technology is there and where is it going? I haven't got a good answer at the minute because whilst we can come up with technologically good ideas, the quite interesting aspect of our work is that we have to then incorporate those ideas into the community. And we're dealing with a relatively enthusiastic audience who, by virtue of them going into a shop to buy a helmet, are recognizing the risk. And so all we have to do is make a solution that is light enough and thin enough, and then it will be successful. Those two in themselves are huge challenges that we by no means underestimate, and certainly over the last four or five years um, aren't obviously nearer to solving. But other applications of similar technologies have even more challenging um, social aspects to require their uptake. And it all falls under a very similar umbrella, but where do I see us going? If we could have people that would walk around with an airbag on their hip and on their head, that would be great. But that's not really going to happen. Probably 
more so is the likelihood here. But that is probably socially the bigger and more important challenge to tackle as well. So yeah, I don't know where we're going to be in five years' time. But I don't look forward to having the conversation with my parents that it's now time to walk out like a batsman when it comes to going to bed. And so if that's never going to be a conversation that's going to happen, then how do we come up with solutions that are more subtle than that? Because these are costing a huge amount of money economically. If you're 80 years old and this happens, your risk of premature death because of infection, because of being bedridden, are massively increased. Your quality of life afterwards, when there was nothing wrong with you fundamentally, the day before you're walking with, to the shops and coming home with your shopping bags, and just because you left something on the floor, you're in this state. And your quality of life may, may never be replaced again. And so certainly for the Western world, that is a huge social issue at the minute that we cannot find an engineering solution that is acceptable to our community. And so this whole field of personal protection extends beyond the high-risk activities of working on a building site or, or riding a, a motorcycle or driving a fast car. It extends to fundamental concepts that in some way, shape, or form will affect all of us wherever we are in the world. And, and these solutions are, are pretty cheap, but nobody wants to use them. Yeah. Can I share? <laughs> um, that was one of our ideas, uh, yeah, to have a fluid. And then you end up in this position of, of the problem of weight. And as soon as you get beyond about 300 grams, then it becomes too heavy. Um, that's the perception of our community, or the industry that, that serves our community. Whether you could develop a story that a local community can buy into, that there is significant value from being achieved by wearing a heavier helmet, is a different challenge. For example, the American footballers have got a massive metal grill on the front. And so their helmets are considerably heavier than, than the helmets that you would traditionally see for, for motorcycling. And so it's not inconceivable that another kilogram in mass for an American football helmet would be acceptable, whereby another kilogram for a child's bicycle helmet, the, the proportions are very different. We've played around with the idea. I'm not going to say we've explored it extensively, but we certainly like the idea. We like the idea of trying to design a structure and a fluid that interact with one another. That, from a scientific point of view, also enables us to engage with emerging computational environments as well, fluid structural interaction. So you have this interaction of a bespoke structure and a tailored fluid. Thinking a number of steps ahead, could we forget about expecting our elderly parents to wear cricket pads to bed? And could we have a floor surface that is in some way replacing the functionality of the pad? Could it be that there's a fluidic-based floor surface that is able to offer enhanced protection when someone falls? There's a field of exo um, exotic materials called oxetic materials. That's a material with a negative Poisson's ratio that pulls in when it compresses. Is that a potential benefit here that the density of your structure at the impact site actually increases? As you say, could you add a fluid into that as well? And so there are loads and loads of questions that are absolutely valid questions that at the minute we have no answer to. One of the risks of doing anything with the floor and having some kind of impact layer on the floor is that inherently you make the floor less stable. And so you're actually increasing the likelihood of someone falling over. But if they do fall over, it's OK because the floor is soft. Is that a better scenario to be in than having um, a risk of fracture by falling over? And so you're absolutely right that shear thinning, shear thickening fluids offer different attributes, some of which appear beneficial in the context of personal protection, 
one of the fundamental problems that we have at the minute is mass. Um, but if we could find scenarios or find different applications of the technology that overcome that limitation or that constraint, then maybe that's a new area of, of exploration that is absolutely worthwhile following. <laughs> Next, you have questions, Rachel. Next, you stiffness in terms of. Um, we've tried all kinds of things on a relatively low level basis. Um, and so I wouldn't want to say that we've exhausted any of our investigations because much like the environment here that I've learned over the last week, the ability to do research is absolutely dependent on getting money for it. Um, and so whereas we've been fortunate to get pockets of money for, for certain focused areas of research, um, typically we have student projects that are um, focused on exploring new ideas. And so negative stiffness, uh, auxetic materi uh, materials have been kind of thrown into the mix for, for student projects. Um, with that, you then get some data that is indicative, but not perhaps hugely informative because of limitations in, your, um, in the process that you followed. And so, so we've, we've looked at a range of different approaches. We've looked at fluid structure and interaction as well. We've tried to have fluid moving from one cell to another. Um, None of which at the minute is to a level that we'll be happy to comment on whether that's a successful technology or not. Um, but certainly, it's not something that we would ever discount from exploring at this stage. Yep. Well, absolutely, and throughout all of these kind of conversation, we've talked purely about this vertical impact. The reality is that we want to start looking at shear as well. Um, and so when you look at different layers having different mechanical attributes, um, then as we and others become more advanced at our simulations, then I think we're more likely to look at more sophisticated solutions such as that. Um, we've certainly got opportunity to do it because we do have layers of material. But at the minute, they all serve the same function. Um, but as you say, to have a positive and a negative layer uh, in terms of their stiffness would theoretically seem to add value. Um, but I say that our problem is that we have so many parameters that we can fiddle around with. Um, so we can change the geometry, we can change the material properties. Um, we're in danger of going off in lots and lots of different directions without much direction um, and doing a superficial job of lots of things that don't really add huge value to anything. Uh, but no, that's not to discount your idea at all. Um, it sounds one that, that certainly theoretically has, has, has lots of promise. <laughs> 